are ready for chapter two of our art appreciation course and today's title is what is art so we've talked about aesthetics and what these questions of what is art why is it good why do we like it why do we not like it all of those types of things about our senses and so what is art is very is a very um, aesthetic question and we're going to just kind of go through many different topics today. You can see this list right here on the screen of artists and audience, art and beauty, art and appearances, art and meaning, art and object. And we're just going to cover all these different topics, um, kind of digging at that question, what is art? So the first topic is artist and audience. And think about that. You have an artist making something and you have an audience uh, viewing it, using it, accepting it, taking it. Um, how does that work? And has it always been the same in history? <clears throat> well, it hasn't. Our modern world of art includes things as we know today, like art schools, where you can go and learn about art and learn to be a better artist. Um, there are galleries where you can hang your artwork. Um, some are very prestigious. Some are just simple ones that you can get into in small towns. All types of galleries where artists try to have their work seen, perhaps purchased, so they can make money at it. There are art critics, um, people who have clout in the art world and can uh, evaluate how good or how bad a work of art is. There are collectors who have been collecting work um, for hundreds of years. There have been collectors, um, even the oldest civilizations. Uh, the more wealthy typically would be the collectors of the art. Like you look at Greek, um, <clears throat> Greek time periods or Rome and you have, um, the wealthier who have the mosaic floors and the paintings on their walls, the frescoes. So, um, it's definitely something that people have enjoyed and wanted to collect for many, many years. And it's typically people that have more money because artwork is something that is usually expensive. And then, and we have that today though, definitely art collectors today all throughout the world. And then we also have museums, many, many, many museums from the Smithsonian all the way down to um, just local small town museums that collect artifacts and things that show evidence of what artists have made um, and just everything in between. So this is our modern world of art and it features individual artists um, people who are making artwork in the contemporary world, in the modern world, um, and making a name for themselves, uh, becoming famous or trying to become famous through um, recognition of what they have done, <clears throat> expressing their own ideas, not necessarily what other people want them to do, but expressing their own ideas. So that's kind of um, a perspective, a big perspective, a generalized perspective of our modern art world. Now, of course, there's lots of different things in between and lots of different varieties of how art works throughout the world in different cultures and different eco economic levels. Um, this is a, very much a generalization about the modern Western art world. But it hasn't always been that way. So it's important to think about how uh, artist and audience has changed over time. Along this same idea of artist and audience, in the past, an artist typically worked for a client or a patron or collaboratively in a workshop. So a client is someone who would uh, pay for the goods that this person can make. A patron might be a person who can pay money for what the person can make. And so <clears throat> like kings and queens would oftentimes have their own personal artist, that the, it was their artist they painted only what the king or queen wanted them to paint. Um, a lot of times portraits and things like that, which only the wealthiest could afford. Um, and in even older time periods, if you're talking back, you know, to um, certainly ancient time periods, and uh, we do know artists from Greek and Roman times, um, the Middle Ages, you have several that it's common to know names then, but um, a lot of times in this older time period, artists just didn't, weren't recognized individually. Um, they were hired for what they could do. It was seen more as a job 
been like this expressive, independent, um, uh, elevated status of a creative person who can make what they wanted. So one example of this type of artwork where it's not so much about the artist as it is about the artwork and who wanted the artwork. Uh, this is a collaboration of multiple artists <clears throat> working in a workshop of 16th century India. Um, Dagavanta, Madhava Kurd, and Travana were employed by the royal workshops <clears throat> excuse me, of Akbar, a 16th century emperor of the Mughal dynasty in India. Their job, which they were paid a monthly salary, was to produce lavishly illustrated books for the delight of the emperor and his court. Akbar ascended to the throne at the age of 13, and one of his first requests was for an illustrated copy of the Tales of Hamza. Hamza was an uncle of the Prophet Muhammad, the founder of Islam. The stories of his colorful adventures were, and still are, beloved throughout the Islamic world. Illustrating 360 ta uh, tales of the tales of Hamza occupied dozens of artists for almost 15 years. So this was a task that this um, emperor wanted to have uh, created, and <clears throat> he had... Uh, many, many people working on this project of creating this book of the tales, Tales of Hamza. And so it wasn't so much about what they could do individually, it was what they did collaboratively as a group. The painting here portrays the episode in which um, a fighter fights Adra to the draw. The prince in orange is one of Hamza's sons. Another in green, as you can see, there's two in the foreground there fighting. His name is Araj, is a warrior who fights him just to see if he is brave as he is reputed, reputed to be. Looming up in the background is Lanhar, a friend of Hamza. He's portrayed as a giant on a green elephant. So if you look in the distance, up in the upper right corner, you'll see a very large guy with a yellow hat. <clears throat> and or helmet and he's sitting on an elephant if you can see that that's a friend of hamza he's portrayed in the back um on, on on a giant elephant perhaps because of his role as an important presence behind the scenes so sometimes a single artist would be responsible for an entire illustration but more often these types of paintings were the were collaboration um, each one contributing what they do best um, so those three artists listed there uh, in the side would have all participated in this painting, um, each one doing what they do best. Maybe one drawing out the entire picture and then maybe another one working on those. You see how they have like the rocky things with the shadows and highlights. Maybe another one was good at that part and another one was good at the detail and the um, uh, patterns that you see on the warriors. <clears throat> So this is just an example of many, many, many historical works where uh, this is more what you would have seen, where you had collaboration in a workshop. And really, um, prior to the 19th century, much of the world of art would have been created through a process of what we call apprentice and master. Um, many things, like all types of, of work, uh, goldsmiths and potters and painters alike, all the different types of arts and crafts that we have, even even more uh, functional things like shoemaking and different things like that, was done through a process of apprentice and master. So you have the master who is really good and has been doing it his whole life, and then he has an apprentice work under him, <clears throat> and the master is making all the money, um, doing less work because he has trained his apprentice or multiple apprentice to do the, the hard part of the job, do the things that he doesn't really want to waste time to do. He's doing maybe the finishing work or the, um, the final part of the, of the making of the artwork where the apprentice has to do all the hard labor. Um, but those apprentice work up through different levels 
until they reach the point where they have the skill of the master and then eventually can take over the workshop, whatever that workshop may be. And this was just typically how um, the process worked. It's not so much like that today. We've kind of replaced apprentice and master with just having art tools. Um, but in some regards, it's, it's a missing thing that probably uh, makes it not as um, special as it once was because <clears throat> the master just has so many things that they have learned through their lifetime that they learned from their master and had worked up as an apprentice um, that just cannot be taught through books or YouTube videos or things like that. The master um, working one-on-one -on -one with the apprentices is a special thing that we don't really have that much today. So a lot of times these types of artworks from this time period, prior to the 19th century, and when these things were in, um, created in uh, workshops like this, the goal was to produce works for churches or specific projects like this. Um, this guy wanted his book to be illustrated and produced. <clears throat> Civic buildings, public spaces, or for private residences. Again, money has a lot to do with it, people that can afford such things. It's all based on commissioning. <clears throat> you are paid to do what they want you to do, and you don't have freedom for creating your own desires or creativity. Much different than these workshops um, where you have people working for commission simply to please the patron, simply to create what the patron who's paying the money wants, is something called outsider or folk art. This is um, very different. <laughs> it refers to artwork that is created by the non-professional artist who has not been trained in an art school, who has not been trained like we were talking about um, in a master to apprentice workshop. Folk, outsider, naive, intuitive, primitive, and brute are all words that um, basically mean uh, non-professional and so it's interesting to think about that because there's a lot of non-professional artwork that has been elevated to the level of um, being uh, high-end high quality fine art um, many examples of that in art history but here is one example I'm going to show you that's very interesting this was done by James Hampton it's called Throne of the Third Heaven of Nations Millennium General Assembly. It's quite a title, 1950 to 1964. Um, and this is on display in the Smithsonian, but it's super interesting because this was discovered um, when they got into this man's garage, I believe after he had passed away, and uh, they found this incredible sculpture with incredible detail um, in his garage where he had used it as like a workspace. He was actually a janitor for the federal government in Washington, D.C., and he labored secretly in this actually rented garage. Um, no one knew he was doing it. It was totally his own private personal work. He was completely untrained, had absolutely no um, professional education in art or skill that way. Um, and so we call this outsider art. We call this art um, that is not on the inside you could think of as the known art world. This is just completely outside of it. His vision, um, what this shows is his vision of the preparation for the second coming of Christ. And what it is, is so interesting, all objects, these are objects of, and furniture that he has put together. So like kind of just combine different things together, but they're all wrapped in silver and gold foil. And so that's where you get that very metallic, interesting look. Um, just a fascinating piece of this man's imagination of thinking about uh, his, what he has as his vision of the coming of Christ and how that will be. This is an example of outsider art. So those are all under the category of artist and audience. Like, who are you making it for? James Hampton was making this purely for himself, maybe for God. Maybe it was a, 
piece of worship art for him, like, you know, um, reflection of his study of, of the Bible. But it wasn't for outsiders. No one even knew he was doing it. He never intended it for it to be on display. Um, and then we have the other example we looked at of the Indian art where um, it, they didn't have any say in what they were doing. It wasn't coming from their soul or heart at all. It was just what they were instructed to do in the workshop they worked in. So such a variety um, of artists and audience. And then now today, as we've talked about, where so many artists are just doing what is um, their totally their own creative outlet and what they want to express uh, very personal. So it's a big difference in the variety from art of art and audience. The next topic for chapter two is art and beauty. And we've touched on this quite a bit in the last lecture. We talked about aesthetics. Reminder, it's a philosophy of the nature and meaning of beauty as it pertains to art. So in chapter one, we discussed this in relation to our sensory experience to nature, made things and art. We talked about that. Um, you can talk about your aesthetic reaction to God's creation, to things made by man and to also to art. Um, but now we're kind of thinking of it more as like, what is the meaning of beauty as it pertains to art? And does that matter? Does something have to be beautiful to be art? I imagine that you can know just from your exposure to the art world going along through life that you know that that's not always the case. The art doesn't have to be beauty. Um, so how does this work? Um, we will go through a few examples of that. And does art, should it be beautiful to be considered art? And how can art not be beautiful, but still be highly valued in society? How is that? Um, so in this other word to know for this chapter is disinterested contemplation. You might write that one down, disinterested contemplation. You can break that apart. Disinterested, you're not interested in something. Contemplation, you're thinking about something. <laughs> Contemplating. It refers to looking beyond the actual, practical, and personal in search of beauty and pleasure. Give me a second to write that down. Looking beyond the actual, practical, and personal in search of beauty and pleasure. So hopefully the next images that I show you will help that become a little clearer. People are different too. It's funny how some people with art are searching for beauty. They want to see something beautiful represented. Um, and so when they don't find that in art, they immediately say it's bad. Um, and I can understand that. That's, um, that's understandable thinking. But sometimes you can look beyond what you actually see, um, and find beauty. And if you don't find beauty, you might find them something interesting at least. So on this next slide, take a look at these two works of art. The first one is called Cabbage Leaf by Edward Weston and 1931. Um, so this is an interesting way to think about beauty. What we see here is kind of like, um, a cool form, very shadowy, um, very sweeping. You see how the light affects the ridges and you have the highlights and the shadows. It's very graceful, an arching leaf. You can almost detach it from what it is and um, you know what it is because of the title. He could have titled it something else and we wouldn't have known what it is. If, if it, We might have thought it was just a piece of draping fabric or something. But he did title it Cabbage Leaf. 
But when we look at this, the way it's photographed and the way it's presented to us, it's so um, almost dreamlike and, and graceful that you, you do detach what it is from how it looks. So this is kind of that example of like disinterested contemplation where you're, you know what it is and you, you might be thinking, is it going to be chopped up for coleslaw or is it, um, is it wilted? What is it? How, how nice is this piece of cabbage leaf? But most likely the way it's presented to us, you're accepting it as more of a beautiful form. You accept it as a curved and pure form and not just looking at it as a plain old cabbage leaf. You look more of it like a ball gown swooping around um, a person. Then we can look at Francisco de Goya's Saturn devouring one of his children. <laughs> and I think it's um, quite a different emotion that we get from that. Take a second to check out that image. So uh, Weston detaches himself from any feelings he might have about cabbages to create that photograph. Um, not all art makes this sort of attachment so easy, really. An image such as this one, the De Goya's uh, De Saturn devouring one of his children, seems to shut down any possibility for aesthetic distance. It grabs us by the throat and it shows us a vision of pure horror. This painter um, worked during the decades around the turn of the century. Goya lived through tumultuous times and witnessed terrible acts of cruelty, stupidity, warfare, and slaughter. He was the unofficial painter of the Spanish court and he often painted, this is very interesting about him, how he painted lighthearted scenes, tranquil landscapes, dignified portraits, um, but in his own works, for his own reasons, he expressed his increasingly pessimistic view of human nature. This painting is one of a series of nightmarish images that Goya painted on the walls of his own home. By their compelling visual power and urgent message, we recognize them as extraordinary art. But they have, you have to admit, they do not make you feel um, things of pleasure or beauty or anything like that. So he was um, obviously tormented by what he was living through in that time period of war. Um, seeing cruelty and things that he saw, but, and that's what he chose to surround himself with, what was in his own mind. But then he was a court painter and painted these beautiful um, scenes for his, for his patron, what he was hired to do. But an interesting spin on thinking about um, art and beauty between these two works of art. Okay, so for our next um, topic, we're going to talk about art and appearances. So when you look at a work of art, these are some things you can start to understand about them just in how they look. Art is represented in a variety of ways in the Western art world. The following terms are used to help describe the visual appearance of artwork. And I think you'll find that you can do this very easily. This will be something that makes a lot of sense, um, even if you haven't had a lot of experience looking at art. So this is art and appearances. So this is the first one. I would like you to write these definitions down. These are pretty important vocab that you probably will see on tests and quizzes and things. Representational, pretty much what it sounds like. Representational has the word representation in it, and it means art that represents and looks like the world around us. Art resembles, I'm gonna read the definition now. Art resembles forms found in the natural world the result is a recognizable likeness of objects and forms. So if, if an artwork is recognizable, looks like something you see in the natural world, has the likeness of something, you know, you look at a painting of a apple and you say, that looks like an apple. 
then you have you are looking at a piece of representational art if you look at a painting and you can't even tell what you're looking at then you are not looking at a piece of representational art so kind of subheadings or sub categories under this heading of representational we have these other two words trump boy and naturalistic so i'll give you a second to write those definitions down Trompe l'oeil is a French word that just means to fool the eye. And naturalistic is artwork that is very faithful to our visual experience. So um, they sound similar, right? They sound like they might mean similar of the same thing. Well, actually, you may not understand totally what fool the eye means. But um, these are both types of representational art. Think of it as naturalistic means the artist is really trying to make it look pretty much like real life. Like that's their goal is to capture a representational realness or authentic looking um, vision, visual experience of what they see. Um, so if you think back to, um, I'm trying to think of some that we've looked at, those works by Vincent van Gogh, would not be super naturalistic because he's changing a lot of that and we're going to talk about what that type of art is in a second but that's something that hopefully you have in your brain is what um, van gogh's artwork looks like it's very expressive and bold bright colors thick impasto brush strokes and so it's not not his goal wasn't to make it look just like what he sees that wasn't his goal the next couple images I'll show you are examples of rep both representational art. They represent real life. Um, but one is done in the style of Trump alloy, and one is done more just naturalistic. So here is, um, this is a sculpture. So it's a photograph of a sculpture in a, in a museum or art gallery. This is done by Dwayne Hansen, and he did many, many works of art like this. Um, to create extremely realistic um, images or sculptures of people. And he liked to take people just doing ordinary things, um, blue collar jobs, not, not trying to show um, the fanciest of people. As you can see, this is a painter who's got paint all over him. Um, so it is called House Painter 3. He did do a series of different house painters. And there's like a drop cloth out on the floor of the museum and then um, the sculpture of this person. But I mean, you can tell this is like wax museum, high level wax museum quality, where when you look at it, it's so realistic. You can't tell that it's not the real thing, hardly. It just looks like a real person standing still. So that would be an example of Trump alloy. It's tricking your eye. It's so highly realistic that it's tricking your eye. This is an example of representational. Again, remember they're all representational. That's kind of the broad category. If it looks real, if it looks like it's supposed to be real life or imitating real life, then it's representational. You can tell what it is. It's representational. But this is naturalistic where it looks naturalistic and he was, this sculptor was copying real life and trying to make it look as accurate as possible. Look at the detail of the ears and the nose. Um, so trying to create it look real life, but it's naturalistic, we would call it. Not, it's not believable that this is a real person. We know this is a sculpture. It's not, it's not necessarily tricking your eye into thinking it's a real person. So that would be an example of naturalistic. Continuing with this topic of art and appearances, abstract art uh, distorts, exaggerates, or simplifies the natural world to provide essence or universality. Um, so what does essence mean? Like instead of it showing a real defined specific person, 
an image might give the essence of a person. So looking back at the slides I've already talked about, this one, you could say it's somewhat abstract. I don't know if the real um, person that this sculpture represents had those lines on their face or if that's just part of the, um, the, uh, the sculpture process and represents something in, in that tradition, in that culture. Um, but in, certainly in this image, which is so representational that it's Trump Alloy, uh, you don't have just the essence of a person, you have every detail of a person, so that it's very, very, very realistic. So that's, that's, a lot, that's what the idea of essence is, or universality is like um, just making universal reference to something, kind of a simplified version of something. So I think you will see that in the examples we have for abstract, which is this one. This would be what we would call abstract. Um, it is called Woman with Packages. And so we've done a couple figures so far. We did Dwayne Hansen's House Painter 3. Uh, we did the sculpture from the Yorba tribe and now we have this version these are all three images or artworks done to represent a person right well the first one is highly realistic to the point where it's trump alloy second one is representational but um not uh maybe quite as believable that it's real life and then this one we have which we definitely categorize further on the spectrum as being abstract so that you probably can look at this and, and get the gist of a figure of some sort of person, even without the title, perhaps. But you might think more like a fish or a spaceship or something like that if you were just guessing what that looked like. Um, however, we do, after a closer study, you start to say, okay, I do sort of see like a head. It's definitely a vertical figure. But then the the title definitely gives you, gives it away, is that it's supposed to be an abstract version of a person, and then that black thing on the one side maybe is the packages. Perhaps that's the packages that the woman's holding. Uh, so, I hope you can see that while this is um, perhaps recognizable as a figure of a person, it would not be categorized as representational, because that's not really the goal of the artist. Her goal was to create the essence of a person, maybe, or the universal image of what a person-ish looks like. <laughs> um, but it has definitely been abstracted, in other words, changed, what's the definition of abstract? Distorted, exaggerated, simplified. Another word could be changed in some way, which is pretty much what distorts means um, from what real life looks like. Now, is this artist, is she capable of making a figure of a person that looks very, very realistic? I don't know. I have not inspected her, her entire scope of work or abilities, but probably, probably much more than this, probably has art training and can draw or sculpt very realistically, I'm guessing. She chooses not to. She chooses to make art for whatever reason that is very simplified, changed, abstracted down to this basic form that we see here. Um, <clears throat> however, this is still somewhat recognizable as a figure, perhaps. The next one we're going to look at is where it is taken to a whole new level of not recognizable, and we call this type of abstract art non-representational or non-objective. Those are synonyms. So if you write this in your notes, <clears throat> which would be a good idea, do write down these two words, non-representational. You could even write slash non-objective or in parentheses non-objective. And it's art that contains no reference to the natural world as we see it. This art is also referred to as non-objective. So Usually what people do is they look at non-objective or non-representational art and they try to find something in it that they can recognize. They try to 
make it into something in their mind, which is just our, that kind of goes along with selective pers pers um, uh, perspective. We want to, um, we want to find something that we recognize. And so oftentimes that will happen, but really the artist isn't intending that oftentimes. They are just making art for art's sake for whatever purpose they have in their own personal desire, but, and creative, creative uh, outlet, but they're not, their goal is not to make something that's recognizable. So here is an example of non-representational. There are many, many, many types of shapes and forms of non-representational. It could be a painting. What you're looking at here is a sculpture, a photograph taken of a sculpture sitting in an art gallery somewhere which the art gallery kind of looks like an old warehouse or something, if you look at the ceiling. Um, so instead of imitating or interpreting appearances, non-representational non artists find meaning and expressive power, like they're powerfully expressing and they find the ability to do that in the elements of art itself. They, in the elements which we're gonna cover next time, in the next chapter, are line, form, color, texture. So they're looking just using those basic tools. What color do I want to make this thing? What shapes do I want to make this thing? Is it going to be three-dimensional and have form and take up depth? Um, is it going to have texture? So they're using just these basic elements to create a feeling. Um, really, a, it can have very deep meaning but sometimes it's just for the interesting effect of it in itself. I don't have a reference as to how big this one is that you're looking at, um, but you can get an idea that that is, um, those are probably more than eight foot walls. They're probably extra tall, like 12 foot or even 20 foot. So I think it's a pretty big sculpture. So the size and the scale of the thing is part of the artist's um, exploration with this non-representational art. Now, as you can imagine, this has not been always accepted. Old, um, before the 20th century, it was definitely resisted, um, considered very revolutionary to do this style of art. The, the people who first started doing very abstract non-representational art um, were rejected, of course. And as we, when we get to the art history portion of our course, that is a trend that happens. A new, an artist comes out with a new style or type of art, and it's always rejected and looked on like, oh, that's so shocking. That's, <clears throat> that is not within the boundaries of what art is and what good art is. And then after some time passes, those boundaries are pushed out. Um, and so now in this modern era that we live in, we're, we're uh, postmodern or actually beyond postmodern. Um, it's, it's like, what can we not do? <laughs> what could possibly be done that wouldn't be considered art? It's just really gone. There's no box anymore. The box has been exploded. <laughs> and there's anything goes and anything can be considered art, really. But today, because today, um, non-representational, abstract, um, non-objective, those are all kind of lumped together like synonyms, but think of it, remember, you have abstract um, sort of as the overarching thing, and then you have non-representational is a type of abstract. It's like the extreme abstract, think of it that way. And now artists use this style a lot. Well, we're still in art and appearances. We've been covering this for several slides now. Art and appearances. So when you look at art, what do you see? We have a couple more <clears throat> definitions to think about in this category of art and appearances. We have stylized and style. They sound similar, but they mean slightly different things. So stylized is artwork that conforms to a preset style or set of conventions for depicting the world. 
um, that would simply mean uh, that there's a way to create clouds that you find frequently in Chinese art, creating the scrolling looking clouds. Um, and so you see that stylized way of drawing clouds repeating throughout a lot of Chinese art done by different artists. Um, though every artist may have their own slightly different stylized way of creating those type of clouds. Um, so it's just a, it's almost like a technique or a repeated way that artists will create um, something or, or depict things in their artwork. Another one is Egyptian art. You probably have seen Egyptian art or can think about what that might look like with the um, figures kind of standing in a strange pose with their shoulders straight on, but their head turned to the side, um, and then their legs turn sideways. So it's like head sideways, shoulders straight on, hips turned to the side. That's sort of the classic look of Egyptian art figures. Um, so that will be stylized. Different artists throughout the many, many years of the Egyptian empire would create art that looked similar to that. Now it changed throughout, which we actually learned about later this semester, um, depending on actually who was the pharaoh at the time and what type of um, images he liked. But you will see a similar trend that flows throughout Egyptian art that now we call that stylized. Um, it's typically for specific things, like depicting certain things like Egyptian people or the Chinese clouds. You'll see them uh, done in a very similar stylized way. Then style simply refers to characteristics recognized as consistent, reoccurring, or coherent. So you hear that the, the, is a, they kind of overcross each other just a little bit. Um, style is more of a big thing though, and it's usually um, we think of it more as a particular artist has their style. So none other than Vincent Van Gogh again is a great example of looking at his style. He has many, as you heard in the video if you watched it, there's, I forgot how many he did, thousands of paintings and they all, or not all, but many of them have this very distinct style. So like for instance, can you see Van Gogh's style in these four works of art? They're all done by him. They're all um, different scenes, different topics. One is a zoomed out landscape, a starry night, like we saw in, in chapter one. Uh, one is of the iris that he made while he was at the asylum, which is more zoomed in nature, but kind of zoomed in on just flowers. And then one is of the sleeping people in the hay. Um, you see some deep space there. You see some cows or horses grazing, I guess they'd be horses, um, and then the people sleeping in the foreground and you see the texture of the hay, okay, so that's that scene, and then this, the last one in the bottom right corner is an up-close portrait of a person. So they're all very different. They're not, they're different in color, they're different in um, subject matter, but can you see the style of Vincent Van Gogh? He does certain things in his work that is repeated, is characteristic of him. That being one, the very thick paint, applied paint, like it's very loose and choppy brush strokes. It's not blended smoothly. Um, another thing that you see characteristic of his work is that he uses intense colors. And if you watched the video, you would have heard about that too, where um, his earlier work was not as intense of color, but as pigments became more sophisticated and started making synthetic pigments, um, he took advantage of that. Color was his voice in his artwork. And so you see bold, bright, sometimes almost eerie colors <laughs> in his work. So these are things that are part of his style. How does, and what I've just mentioned is color, texture. Um, those are the two main things I think that kind of emphasize his style. Those are elements of art that we'll be talking about. Artists use elements of art, the tools, to create their own style. So 
stylized, um, we could break down these paintings and find different things within them that we could say they're kind of stylized. For instance, um, the way he painted those cypress trees, this one in the top left, um, the way these are kind of like wiggly and tall, that's not really how cypress trees look. They're not that wiggly. Um, they're, they're not even that pointy at the top, I don't think. He kind of exaggerated that that element and so that would be something we could say like the way he creates his trees is very stylized and in other paintings you see this same stylized way of painting the cypress trees so that could be an example of looking within his style <laughs> his loose brush stroke bright colors choppy um, exaggerated style and then finding an element of that that is actually stylized so that kind of sums up both of those words in Vincent Van Gogh's artwork. All right, so we've been covering art and appearances for several for several slides now. Just to review, uh, we talked about. Make sure I'm not missing anything. For art and appearances, was just when you look at a work of art. What can you kind of categorize or um, distinguish just by looking at, at, just looking at it? We talked about representational. We talked about um, abstract. Then we went into stylized and style. Those are all things that have fit under this category of just looking at it and the appearance of it. It's just the general appearance of the work. What can you notice? So the next section is um, art and meaning. Now this goes to a whole different level, right? This isn't just how it looks. This is taking some meaning out of the artwork. How do we do that? Uh, so understanding art is a cultural skill and must be learned. So we break art down into its parts to do this. Art has what we would call embodied meaning, meaning that even when the artist is trying not to make their artwork about something, it's always about something. It's just got an embodied meaning no matter what. And then we have form and content, which I'm going to go uh, into depth a little bit more about um, what form and content mean. So in your notes, um, go ahead and write what embodied meaning means, and um, or how and how you would say that to make it make sense to you. And then um, uh, leave some room for form and content if you're going to write those down now. In fact, you don't have to write them right now because we're going to go into more depth on each of those. So first we're going to talk about form. Form is the way a work of art looks, just very generally. You know, it, it, it's what it looks like. And that's really what we were talking about back with art and appearances in that <clears throat> previous section where we were looking at Van Gogh's work and we talked about the style and the stylized element of the cypress tree. Those are all things that fall under this idea of how it looks. Okay, so just getting your mind. Form is how a work of art looks. And it includes some things like media. For instance, what, what did the artist use to make it? If they used pencil, it's going to look a lot different than if they used polymer clay and made it sculpture that's colorful. So there's just the, the media, the materials they use <clears throat> are gonna meet, dramatically affect what the form looks like, what it looks like. When you see media like that, don't think news <laughs> or um, any kind of media outlet like that. When we talk about media in art, we're talking about the materials. What is it made out of? <clears throat> so, these three things, media, 
material view. Style, which we talked about before, is consistent or constant, reoccurring or coherent traits. Things that you see repeated. And then Van Gogh's, we talked about that. <clears throat> Some of those reoccurring traits, the brush strokes, the bright colors, um, the kind of strange drawing of things. Everything looks kind of wiggly and twisted just a little bit. So that would be like style. You notice those things when you look at a work of art. And then composition. This is something we haven't talked about yet. It's an organization of design, which we organize elements and principles. Now, you don't know what the elements and principles are yet, and that's okay. So just for now, think of it more as how you arrange things, how you arrange the work of art. If it's, if it's on a piece of paper, how is everything going to fit on that piece of paper? Is it going to run off the side? Is it going to be zoomed in so everything's really big or is it going to be zoomed way out so you're just looking at things from way back bird's eye view like a like a drone view of something that all has to do with the composition how is it fitting on the piece of paper and also the organization of um, shapes and colors and textures and are you going to show movement but we'll get into all that stuff later so for now just think of it as the organization of things in the artwork but those are all things you notice when you first look at a piece of art. So I have a couple examples here. Um, if you'll look at the titles of them, they actually have the same title, Adoration of the Shepherds. The one on the left, Giorgione, uh, and the one on the right, El Greco. However, let's look at them. They do depict the same general scene. Um, this is from the Gospels when, uh, probably specifically Luke, when the shepherds came uh, from the fields because they had seen the star, or because they had seen uh, the celebration in the sky of the celestial beings worshiping and praising God. And they went to where the Christ child was and found Mary and Joseph and the baby. Um, so, similar scenes. You have um, the same main people. You have shepherds, Mary, Joseph, and the baby, Jesus. Um, looking back and forth, do you see any other similarities between them? You can call those out loud if you do in class. I think it's easier to find differences. Maybe one similarity would be that they're all looking towards the Christ child. They're all kind of centralized around that and, and looking at the child. Um, but then we could look at the differences. So every there's a lot of differences. Everything from one appears to be a nighttime scene, El Greco's, and Giorgione's per uh, perceives to be a daytime scene. Um, then you have composition. How are things arranged on the piece of paper? Both of them are paintings, but how are they arranged? Um, one, you have uh, Giorgione is zoomed out a little bit, so you see some of the landscape in the distance. You see more of the cave. Um, you see kind of the path leading up to where they are. So it's definitely zoomed out. The figures are a little bit smaller. In El Greco's, you have it zoomed way in, and um, even it, almost like a drama scene on a stage, and the, some of the figures are even starting to run off the side of the page. Uh, you could compare them, um, and if your instructor wants to pause this and have a little discussion, that will be great. You can just shout out what you see comparison-wise. Um, so if you do that, that's fine. Uh, but I'll just keep verbally comparing them. So like one has almost, the, the El Greco on the right side has almost like a um, more mystical feel and you see the angels present there. You actually have uh, beings that aren't able to be seen being seen. <laughs> the, the, pa 
painter has allowed us to see the spiritual side of this thing. Um, let's see. Everything is very, and so the other one does not have that, that I can tell. I don't see any angels or, or spiritual things. Um, another comparison and difference between them is El Greco's feels very theatrical and lots of movement. Some of the some of the drapery and fabric on the people seems to almost be moving like they're in mid motion. Uh, then over on Giordione's, it's um, very still, a more serene and still scene. The color in El Greco's is dramatic shadows with kind of these bursts of color, but very dark, very dark, clear to deep black. Um, if you look at the man's leg right in the front in the middle, He's got a green green cloak on. You can see his leg has look at the shadow differences in that. There's like bright highlights, almost like a fire in, on the inside where um, the light is coming from the Christ child to like pure black shadow on the back side of his knee. So very dramatic shadowing of lights and darks. So that gives it that theatrical appearance too. The figures are kind of in the El Greco are kind of um uh almost they're almost drawn in a way that is not realistic they almost look stretched out over exaggerated maybe um where the the figures in georgia Gionis is um they're more realistically drawn they're more uh not exaggerated in muscle structure or or bone structure it just feels pretty uh, maybe accurate or <clears throat> not overemphasized. So what I've done there is I've just gone back and forth. I've compared shapes and forms of the people. I've compared colors. I've compared lights and darks. I've compared composition, uh, meaning again, how, how zoomed in, how zoomed out, what's included in the picture plane. Um, I've included the feeling of the of the picture where one feels somber and calm the other feels almost anxious and exaggerated and exciting and theatrical <clears throat> so all of those things i've just talked about are part of what we observe when we look at it right those are all things that we can just look at and compare we've talked about composition and style um <clears throat> and so what materials were used we mentioned they were both paintings um, but in this case, the paint, the paint was used in a very different way, wasn't it, from one to the other. So it's good to just stop and pause and let your mind do that where you can compare. Comparing things is a wonderful way to examine things and understand what you're seeing more. Along with art and meaning, we can look at the materials and the techniques. What art is made with and how it's made are some of the first aspects of a work that grabs our attention. Choosing what materials to use and what techniques to use are critical decisions artists need to create a successful artwork. Um, so we have an interesting example of this with uh, a few, a few uh, images for you to look at. So this is Auguste Rodin, The Kiss, very famous sculpture, sculptor and sculptor. Um, Rodin is how you pronounce it, and it was made in 1886. This is made out of white marble. Very, um, we'll just take a second to examine that artwork and, and see what you can assess based on its meaning from what materials and technique this was used.
So it's made out of white marble, which is considered a more precious sculpture material. The image is of two very perfectly formed human beings in a moment of love and a kiss, um, a very uh, lovely human um, interaction between these two perfectly sculpted, very detailed white um, figures. White marble has long been the standard material for sculpture in Europe. It's very hard and it's very difficult to sculpt, um, but it's considered like the higher level art, art material. Okay, so we have that. Let's compare it to um, Antoni's artwork called Gnaw <laughs> from 1992. This is a very interest one, interesting one. This is a contrast we're showing here between these two. Gnaw consists of 600 pound cube of chocolate and a similar one of lard. Each one, you're going to love this, is gnawed by the artist herself. The chewed, the chewed portions of lard were made into lipsticks and the chocolate was made into heart shaped par partitioned boxes for fancy gift chocolate. These are displayed in a nearby showcase, which um, if you look through that little door right there, you can see the showcase where these are displayed. It's kind of the, the lower one with the chocolate block, and then you can see in the back. There's our showcase of, of these other displayed things that she made out of the chocolate and the lard that she chewed off of the block. <laughs> so chocolate has a strong association with love. Uh, both a token of affection, of affection. Lard summons up obsessions with fat and self-image, which in turn are linked to culturally imposed ideals of female beauty, as is lipstick. So, even though this is, seems strange, there's a lot of message here. Gnaw is about the gap between the, petri the, the prettified commercial world of romance and the private, more desperate craving. It both feeds on and causes. The gnawed blocks of chocolate and lard resemble the base of Rodin's statue after the couple has gone, and perhaps that is part of the message as well. The kiss wants to convince us that love is beautiful and that we are beautiful when we are in love. Not always, Gnaw replies, and the romantic illusions that works such as the kiss inspire are part of the problem. So it's kind of an interesting um, comparison and juxtapositioning of these two works of art that are very, very different, yet in a strange way can have a relation. So that shows you materials and technique can definitely influence the meaning of a work of art. Okay, so now the second part. Um, under the original heading of art and meaning is content. We've talked about form. Let me flip back to that just to make that clear again. Form again is the way a work of art looks. And we can start to um, assess the meaning by how something looks, right? So we have media, what was used. Was it lard? Was it marble? We have style, which is how an artist creates works that are so like Van Gogh's where it's consistent and reoccurring coherent traits. And then we have composition, the organization of how the artist has put things together. Okay, so um, now we're moving on to the second one, which was content. And that is what a work of art is about. This includes subject matter and message. Form is how it looks. Content is what it's about. Subject matter is general idea. Um, and in representational art, we can definitely look at it and say, oh, well, that's a picture of a person. We get that. That's the subject matter. Or um, like in Rodin's sculpture, those are two people kissing. That's the subject matter. Got it. Um, perhaps with gnaw, the subject matter is a little harder to understand, right? It, that would be an example of abstract, non-representational art. It's not really a picture of anything or a sculpture of anything other than it is just a cube of chocolate and a cube of lard. So um, 
subject matter matters. <laughs> what is it? What is it of? What is it representing? And then message is the more specific meaning. Sometimes that is easy to detect the meaning and sometimes you may have no clue what the artist is trying to say. It may need their explanation for it for you to understand it. I think back to that um, sculpture of or the installation of the giant crack in the museum floor and without maybe a placard that explains what the artist is trying to do in that in that work of art we might just think it's a crack in the floor and not understand it at all so um, that message sometimes is harder to detect than others So going along this thread of um, message, we have iconography. Iconography is um, kind of similar. You can think of it if you were paying attention back with the um, Vanitas paintings that we were looking at um, last time. Those were in chapter one. They had a lot of symbolism in them. They had objects that represented something, right? And the theme of Vanitas paintings is vanity. Vanity, vanity, everything's worth, you know, all things are fleeting in life. Life is short. Judgment day is coming, that type of thing. Um, iconography is similar to that, not the whole theme, but in that objects represent something. And it really requires knowledge of something to be able to, to interpret it. So the story of an artwork, the story of a work of art, including symbols or references, people, events, etc., requires knowledge of a specific time, belief, or culture. Um, when you look at art that has iconography, you have to have a little more background or you're not going to know what those things mean. Where with the Vanitas paintings, you could look at them and probably study that long enough you might start to pick up on oh there's a theme of life death life is short that type of thing um with iconography there's just more symbolic meaning behind the objects not necessarily that theme of life and death and sh life is short um just more like metaphors or representations okay so let's look at an example and see if it becomes a little clearer what iconography is this is one of the most well-known paintings um, to show iconography. It's a very interesting painting um, that there's a lot of mystery behind this one. This is uh, by Jan van Eyck, and it's called the Arnolfini Double Portrait, painted in 1434. <clears throat> so there's a lot of theories on this. Take a second to look into this painting and see what you can see. You have a man and a woman, clearly, a dog, some shoes on the floor. You have um, what appears to be like a fancy bed in the background and a chandelier. The thing right in the middle, clear in the back, is a mirror where you can actually see the reflection of these two figures standing there. This is in the tradition of Northern Renaissance painting. Just to give you a side note, we will look at this time period again later. But Northern Renaissance painting is the style, like we've been talking about, the style of this is very specific to that region of the world and time period. We're talking about Northern European countries, Germany, the Netherlands, um, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, all those areas. And <clears throat> the, the style of that time period is very sharp and clear. Uh, very clean and detailed, extremely detailed with lots of patterns and careful attention to the fancy side of things, like looking at the chandelier, see the detail in that. Uh, the people are typically painted well, but have a bit of a stiffness to them. They don't look super naturalistic. They have a little bit of a, um, oh, just not real. <laughs> Maybe not quite as feeling as real as they could. Um, okay, so that's just a general thing about what paintings in that time period looks like. 
So what are the theories of this painting? Because we're talking about meaning, if you recall. That's the point of this. We're in the topic of meaning. And in this one, we're looking specifically at iconography. So many theories have formed about this painting, one being that they were a wealthy merchant couple being wed. Um, as you can see, it looks like some sort of ceremony. There are many things in the image that would have meaning. So let me just jump into the iconography portion of it now. Um, he's taken off his shoes. If you look at his feet, it's hard to see, but he doesn't have his shoes on. And they lay on the floor next to him. Kind of funny looking shoes. Hers can be seen on the floor in the background. Um, okay, clear back by that red chair or whatever that is clear in the back those would be her shoes seemingly pregnant she stands next to a bed draped in rich red fabric overhead is a chandelier with but one candle on the floor between the couple stands an alert little dog a mirror on the far wall reflects not only the couple but also two men standing in the doorway to the room and looking in standing that is where we are standing as we look into the painting. So you can't see um, into the mirror, I would imagine, from where you are looking at this. Um, but if you could see a close-up of that mirror in the background, there are actually two men standing as if looking into this scene like we are. But then the question is, who are these men? <laughs> it's as if to say, um, Oh, I'm sorry. So over the mirror, as you can see, there is some writing on the wall. Do you see that? And that's actually the painter's signature, and it reads, Jan van Eyck was here, <laughs> which is kind of a funny funny way to sign the painting. Um, so the identity of the couple has been forgotten. It's been bought and, bought and sold so many times, no one knows. They do believe, though, um, that his name is Giovanni. Arno Fini, a rich merchant, and his wife. That's what they, that is what's believed to be the true story. So now some of the symbolism. As you look at those things that I pointed out, let's look at some of the symbolism of it. The men reflected in the mirror are none other than Jan van Eyck and a friend who has served as a witness. Moreover, almost every detail of the painting has a symbolic value related to the sacrament of marriage. The bride's seemingly pregnant state alludes to fertility, as does the red bed and the nuptial chamber. The single candle signifies the presence of God at the ceremony. Has everyone found the candle? The single candle is over on the um, left side behind him. Uh, the dog is a symbol of marital fidelity and love. The couples have cast off their shoes as a sign that they stand on sacred ground. So that is when that this is a marriage ceremony is one theory, but another more recent theory claims that the painting does not depict a marriage, but a ceremony of betrothal, which is an engagement, um, commemorating an alliance between two prominent well-off families. And yet one more theory thinks that this could be the cousin of Arnolfini um, and the image of a wife who died. So the story behind the painting is really kind of up for mystery. Again, lots of theories. But we do know that the potential iconography is, is very real and m most likely a lot of symbolism here. Though we may never know really what the true meaning of the painting is. Some things are just going to be a mystery. So finally, to understand a work of art as created by an artist at a specific time and in a particular culture is referred to context. This is the last piece of art and meaning. And we have to understand the context of something or we don't really understand it at all. Very similar to studying of the Bible. You have to understand the context of the scripture. You can't just take everything verbatim and apply it directly to your life because you have to look at how the scripture was given from God to who at a certain time period. 
and really it goes that way for everything. If you just pick up a book and start reading it of any kind, you have to understand the context of it before you can understand what you're looking at or reading. And it goes that way with art as well. We have to understand the context, the time period. It's very different than um, just, you know, 2024 in the United States. Um, this uh, finial of a linguist staff from Ghana is the Asante people of the 20th century. This is the same um, culture as the Pinta cloth from way back in the previous lecture. So as though all, we can look at it, it has a lot of aesthetic beauty. It's gold, it's very detailed craftsmanship. And works like this are used in West, West African culture for ceremonial times and not intended to be on display in museums. It's, it's actually a staff topper that most only gets a glimpse of in their, in their culture. Just on very rare occasion would this ever be brought in um, to the daylight to be used as a cultural object, as a ceremonial object, excuse me. Um, it's more an object showing the owner's authority and affirms the social order. So it's almost like, uh, Owning this thing would be the point of it, not necessarily to be on display. Well, unfortunately, this thing is on display in a museum, so it's kind of like the context of it is, is misused already just because of um, how we can view it. Even how we're viewing it right now is not the way it's meant to be viewed. So we can appreciate it and look at it and think, oh, wow, that's really cool. It's, you know, this really neat uh clearly rich in culture and meaning for somebody, but unfortunately it's taken out of its context to be shown even in this way and in a museum um, or art gallery when it's really how it was used in its time uh, was more of a private piece. And then we can look at the other image here. Thomas Struts uh, is a, this is a, an altar in the, let me just restate that. It's an image of a church altar. So like when you look into the church, this is just a photograph. You can see there's a very large painting at the altar piece in the front and lots of ornate sculpture and things. Um, it's actually Titian's painting that we can see at the front there. Titian was a very famous uh, Renaissance painter right after the Renaissance. And the painting is titled Assumption which it depicts Christ's assumption going up to heaven after he was resurrected and spent 40 days on earth. It's located in its original and intended setting. The context of this church and importance to Christian viewers of its time is evident in this photograph. Now just think it for a second, if that painting, which it is, to pick, there's many pictures of that painting produced in textbooks and things of just the painting itself. In fact, we may even look at that later this year or, um, when we look at Renaissance art. But look how much it needs to be in its original intended context in that church, um, in this very ornate and glorified place to honor God. And um, you can see even this, the people there, it, it just, it's, a, it's intended for that location and to take it out of that location and just stick it in an art gallery or museum which happens from time to time if you look if you go to an art museum you'd see lots of altar pieces and things that originally were meant to be in churches cathedrals at the front of a church like this um, as a place of worship and honor to god and then they're just kind of taken out and put into uh, museums, it, it definitely loses part of its context, part of its original intent. And so this one shows you what it looks like in the church, in its setting. And you can see the contrast between these two pieces then. Both uh, very uh, finely crafted, special works of art for the culture in which they were created cultural religion. One, however, being taken out of its context and just on display as an item. The other still in its original context, um, being used as it was meant to be. You can see context is very important.
It helps us understand why the work was made. It helps us appreciate it. There's that word again, appreciate it so much more. Um, and so it's just something to think about as you look at works of art. Think about the context. So we have covered several things in this um, chapter. We've covered the key topics of artist and audience. And if you recall, that was um, looking at who is the artist making this for? Uh, in, in modern times, almost definitely, artists are making things for their own desire of creating and for their own sale and for their own uh, reputation and success as an artist where we learned in the older times, historical times, many times it was just uh, an apprentice working for a master and the master was producing something that was needed in the community, whether it was pottery or um, blacksmith or things like that. Um, and then also the audience could be um, something that was just commissioned by a, by a workshop. The, uh, the need is there by someone and so the workshop just makes the thing and people all just work together and they're all just trained to do it but it's no recognition for an individual artist and we also looked at that example of the um, garage artwork where it's made by a person that is unknown um, outsider or folk art so they in that case they don't care who the audience is he, uh, the example we looked at uh, was just making the work of art in his garage because he wanted to for his own personal use. So there's a lot of different instances where the artist um, is thinking of or not thinking of his audience, his or her audience. Then we talked about art and beauty. We looked at um, aesthetics again, a little bit deeper dive into aesthetics uh, and how it is important to look deeper into things to understand maybe more about uh, asking those questions. Does it have to be beautiful? Does it have to look a certain way to be good art? And the answer is probably no, but um, that is also an opinion thing. So if you don't like looking at art that's not beautiful or um, what is beautiful to you, then that's okay. That's, that's, that's everyone's personal opinion. Then we dove into art and appearances and we talked about representational versus abstract and how there's like a spectrum that goes from one end to the other. That spectrum is from clear on one end, non-representational. You can't even tell what it is. It's so abstract that it's just shapes, colors, lines, textures, all the way through every stage up to the other end of the spectrum, which would be trompeloi, which is representational art that's so uh, realistic you can't even tell it's not real life. We talked also about stylized and style, um, and then we also, and then we went on to art and meaning, which was kind of a big topic um, about form and content and the things that form is form is how something looks. When you look at it, what do you see, and what can you assess from that? What do you? What's your analysis of what you're looking at, including media, style, and composition? And then we looked at um, content, which is subject matter and the message. Is there a message behind it? Is it trying to say something? Did the artist use iconography, symbols and things to mean something? Um, we compared the Rodin sculpture to the lard and chocolate sculpture, gnaw, uh, to really show the contrast in that, how art um, based on the meaning can be quite different dramatic parallel and um, opposites there as well. So um, that is basically what we covered for this. I kind of walked through these uh, definitions as we went along to hopefully you wrote down the best you could with it with the definition for those vocab words are the key terms. Uh, I'm just checking through them. Embodied meaning, remember, is like just everything has some meaning. No matter what, even if it's not intentional, you're going to you're gonna see the work of art and you're going to try to assess some, some kind of meaning to that. Um, and then I did mention installation several times. An installation is a work of art, again, that's like in a space. It can be outdoor, indoor, in a gallery. Um, 
but it's it's a certain amount of space that has been set aside for this work of art and then you actually create something that is um, three-dimensional taking up that space using the space not just an object in the space but using the whole entire space maybe it's using the walls and the ceiling and the floor and then throughout it as well um, so yes those are our key terms for chapter two um, that's all we're going to cover today and um, next time will be chapter three which is themes of art we're going to go through seven different themes um, still this kind of big idea of just getting a broad overview of the world of art and we will talk next time thanks and have a great day